<sighs> Hi! <laughs> You're awake. Cool. So, uh, yeah, you're probably wondering what's going on right now. Well, my name is Niche, and you're a Terminator unit that I had dug out of a hydraulic press at the local junkyard. After hours of tinkering, I was able to bring you back online for the sole function of keeping me company down here in my basement because... Well, between you and me, it's because I'm extremely lonely. Anyway, a huge part of the process of repairing you is involved watching and researching a bunch of RoboCop and Terminator stuff because not only are they awesome, but they could actually help me improve your design. Oh, and just for the hell of it, I upgraded your OS to Windows 95 and I got you this knife for self-defense purposes. I simply ask that you don't try to stab me with it because that would totally be a dick move, dude. Okay. Cool, so without further ado, I'm gonna get back to work because we're about to start live streaming a review of a Robocop and Terminator game. I'm back. From the hospital. Apparently, it was a bad idea to give a killer cyborg from the future access to a giant knife and not expect him to try and kill me with it. And according to my attending, it was apparently an even stupider idea to give him a second, larger and sharper knife too once I got home the first time around. Anyway, my time in the critical care unit has me feeling rested, recharged, and ready to get my heart broken again because I still fully intend to try and repair that Terminator. Which is great, because unfortunately I did have to destroy most of his body the third time he tried stabbing me. Thankfully though, all that's left of him is an itty bitty skull, so I should be relatively safe until he's fully operational again. I named him Copernicus, and I think he's the runt of his litter. Released in 1993 through 1994, Robocop vs. The Terminator is a series of adaptations of the Frank Miller comic of the same name for the 8 and 16-bit Sega and Nintendo consoles of the day. Initially developed for the Genesis by Virgin Games, it was then sort of ported to the Game Gear with a Europe-exclusive Master System port by NMS Software before getting an original SNES version by Interplay, a Game Boy version by Unexpected Development, and in a true Unexpected Development, a version for the NES that was developed by Realtime Associates and never got released. In it, you take control of Robocop, portrayed by Peter Weller in the Paul Verhoeven film of the same name, after he's attacked by a Resistance member from the future and learns that he'll become the basis for Skynet, the artificial intelligence from the Terminator series that'll one day bring the human race to near extinction. Determined to stop that from happening, he goes out to defeat the maniacal AI and to save the future from technological doom. The game and comic came out at a time when Robocop and Terminator were absolutely everywhere. 1993 may have brought us the much maligned Robocop 3 after it had been languishing in a vault somewhere for a year thanks to its distributor Orion having some financial troubles, but it also came out just two years after Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which is, you know, one of the best sequels and action movies of all time. Though, interestingly enough, the game actually doesn't have anything to do with T2 Judgment Day and very specifically uses the typography from the first movie on each of its title screens. I can only guess that this is due to all the Robocop movies and the first Terminator being distributed by Orion Pictures, which probably would have made securing the rights to both IPs a bit convenient and cheaper for the developers. Similarly, this may also explain why Arnold Schwarzenegger's face is never prominently seen across anything pertaining to these games outside of the European box art, despite having the most iconic mug attached to either properties. Either that, or he was just busy on Conan or something. It's Arnold Schwarzenegger! Yeah, wow. that's me! You... Can you believe it? I can't believe it! It's I didn't unbelievable. expect you to show up, and none of us did now. Nobody could believe it! Yeah, I... Upon its release, the many versions of the game would go on to get scores ranging from the 90s for the Genesis game, all the way down to the 50s for the Game Boy one. And even though the comic these titles were inspired by would sort of fall into obscurity over the years, the games themselves would go on to become fairly well-known side-scrolling shooters amongst retro gamers, owing mainly to the success and reverence that the Genesis version has. While I didn't see the game on any best of Genesis lists, a lot of people really seemed to love this one, and aside from some complaints about its difficulty, had nothing but praise for the title too, which got me curious as to what was so special about it and its other iterations. 
It also helps that I'm a huge Robocop and Terminator fan and was raised watching all the movies, reading the books, playing the video games, and even watching a few of the TV shows. In fact, I distinctly remember watching T2 on TV for the first time and taping it onto a VHS tape that I probably still have lying around here somewhere. I remember it really distinctly because at the time the War on Terror was brand new and every commercial break was punctuated by terror updates for what's going on in the country. And given the fact that the second half of Terminator 2 skirts very closely to what was going on at the time in terms of uh, terrorism and stuff, it was just a bit uncomfortable for my like seven or eight year old mind to watch and I can't believe my dad let me watch those movies. And even though both of the series have a relatively lackluster track record when it comes to their sequels and video game tie-ins, I've always sort of just enjoyed and appreciated them for what they are anyway. For example, I know that something like Terminator Genesis isn't a good movie by any stretch of the word, but I still kind of enjoy it for what it is, which is a big, dumb, goofy movie. I've always just sort of viewed it as a guilty pleasure movie where I could sit back and go, We are back again with the Terminator. And every so often, there's a diamond to be found in the rough, like 2019's Terminator Resistance, or the really underrated and underdiscussed Terminator Infiltrator novels, which is like a trilogy of books that's a full on sequel to Terminator 2. But do they hold up? Because even though the Genesis game has gotten heaps of praise from shooter fans over the years, that doesn't necessarily mean that it holds up when compared to some of the genre's all-time greats. Nor does it necessitate being revisited when, thanks to games like Cuphead, the genre is still relatively alive and well. Plus, there's also the matter of its other releases, which have comparatively been forgotten as far as the public's concerned. And with so many versions to choose from, are the ones that aren't on the Genesis even worth playing? How do they hold up when compared to each other? For that reason, and that reason alone, I've decided to cash in on one of YouTube and live streaming's favorite trends, which is putting everything on tier lists because, I don't know, like people really seem to like tier lists. Additionally, this will serve as a great excuse to collect some valuable data from these games that could be used to create a new, more powerful full body prosthesis for Copernicus. One that, you know, will be like, probably indestructible once I'm done with it. So sit back and relax guys, because not only do we have a ton of games to go through, but after several months of doing more high concept videos for everyone, I have decided that it's time for me to take a step back and do something a bit simpler. I mean, I think I'm overdue for something like that, right? Just a video of me relaxing, hanging out with my Terminator, live streaming it for anyone who cares. And yeah, I don't know, it'll be, it'll be a good time. We'll have fun. We'll have a really, really good time. And who knows, maybe some of this data could be used to give my Terminator a perm eventually or something. That'd be something. We could give him a perm and call him the Perminator. Sounds like a cheesy porno, don't you think? Perminator, the porno. We, we need a third P in there. Terminator, the prosthetic, with the promo. Por porno, not pro fuck. Before we continue though, a quick question of the day. What's a game to game, movie to game, or heck, movie to movie crossover that you really wish existed? The crazier the better, and there isn't a limit to the number of properties you use. For example, my answer's gotta be a Mario Party style crossover board game starring nothing but vintage 80s pop culture fixtures. Be sure to leave your answer to the question of the day over in the comments. I'd love to hear your answer. And if you're new here and are enjoying what you see so far, feel free to subscribe to the channel and stuff so that you can check out all the other videos I'll be putting out in the future. On top of that, feel free to support my channel via donation or subscription on Buy Me A Coffee or Patreon if you want to access a few bonus goodies like episode commentaries or commentary answers to the question of the day and to help me make more videos. And with that out of the way, on with the video. So I thought it'd be best to start with the Sega Genesis game on account of it being the best known one and being the first one to get produced. Though interestingly enough, it was actually released six months after the Super Nintendo game for some reason. I also thought it'd make sense to start here because even though every other game I'm reviewing today is technically different from this one, they all share in the same fundamentals that started off with this initial version. 
Because of this, this will probably be an extra long chapter, so if you have anything to do or anywhere to go, for example on an extended car ride while you ominously plot to murder one of your future enemies, maybe consider listening to this like it's a podcast while you're on the way. Developed by Virgin Games Media, the game is a silky smooth side-scrolling shooter where you're tasked with mowing down absolute hordes of enemies in the name of justice. If you've ever played anything like Contra, Metal Slug, or Gunstar Heroes, it's basically that, but with Robocop. It also looks fairly similar to the gameplay found in the Sega CD version of The Terminator, which was also by Virgin and is something that I really want to get to play one of these days if you guys are interested in watching that. Whether you're apprehending a common street thug, a security guard for a definitely approaching militaristic tech company, and even ND the endoskeleton over here, you can always expect to handle the situation through the use of lethal force. While every version of the game features about as much action as what's found here, the Genesis game is an absolute gore fest in its earliest levels. And yeah, that's really the note I'll be opening this review on because it's arguably this version's most iconic aspect. Shooting human enemies always has them erupting into pools of blood and screaming in pain in absolutely brutal fashion, which reflects the hyper gritty edge of the original Robocop. This isn't helped by the fact that these levels are absolutely jam-packed with enemies too, so it often feels like you can barely get a few steps in before someone tries to get in your way or attacks you. And like, seriously, what's wrong with these people? Imagine you're standing on the street waiting to attack Robocop and you see him absolutely dismantling everything in his path as he trudges towards you. What moron in his right mind doesn't put two and two together and try to get out of there alive? Honestly, I hate working here. They are so weird. At any rate, the sheer volume of enemies on screen at any moment in this game means that you're in for an absolute hail of bullets chasing you around during your adventure. Like, seriously, you'll constantly need to be on your toes and trying to dodge projectiles, as well as constantly trying to stock up on health and power-ups if you have any intention of actually getting to the end of this thing. Thankfully though, Robocop does have a variety of weapons at his disposal that range from missile launchers, homing grenades that you can control with the D-pad, machine guns, and even a scattershot flamethrower that feels straight out of Contra. On top of that, you can also hold up to two of them at a time and switch between them whenever you'd like, which is awesome on account of how completely outmatched you'd otherwise be without the additional firepower. However, the actual process of picking up weapons does feel needlessly counterintuitive. Natural logic dictates that when you're able to switch between any two weapons at any given moment and are able to pick up weapons by simply walking over them, touching a pickup would automatically equip that item to the weapon slot that you're using. Which makes sense, right? Like, if I have a weapon that I really like and I want to make sure that I keep it, I should probably switch away from it before picking up something else. And yet, Robocop vs. The Terminator decided to have the work and title of Robocop vs. The Terminator vs. Conventional Game Design by automatically adding that weapon to the weapon slot that you aren't using. While it may sound intuitive in its own right, in practice, as well as because of similar games such as the SNES's Contra 3 The Alien Wars, it actually feels pretty annoying due to how it skirts more traditional design philosophies. Still, you're gonna want to look past it anyway since the alternative is not upgrading your weapons at all and that basically spells... Keep firing, assholes! While the first few levels are manageable enough and really just serve as a place to get your bearings with the game and its physics, you'll eventually storm OCP's headquarters and be exposed to what pain feels like if you aren't armed your teeth when you do so. And even though you're still fighting a lot of human beings along with security turrets and stuff of that nature, this is when the game's difficulty really starts to ramp up and when your pistol starts to feel a bit useless. It's actually a really sobering moment for you too, as up until this point in the game, you're basically a one-man army wiping out most enemies in your path with little trouble. Like, yeah, you do encounter a disguised T-800 that looks a bit like Arnold, but not in a legally actionable way at the end of an early level, and you do straight up have to fight Robocop 2, who's still alive and kicking for some reason in another one, but those still feel relatively tame when compared to the absolute gauntlet that you're put through at OCP's headquarters. 
because unlike those challenges, this level wears you out by forcing you to basically fight your way through wave after wave of security with their munitions whittling away at your health as well as your weapon pickups and lives if you die. And if you do so, things get even harder for you as you'll wind up needing to rely on your pistol until you can find another upgraded weapon or pry it from the cold, lifeless hands of an enemy. I like your gun. What? Taking a step back though, it was kinda weird to see Robocop 2 of all characters here at this particular moment, and I'd be a bit remiss if I didn't explain why. Because while I understand that this is just a video game and it doesn't necessarily need to work within the confines of what is or isn't canon, having Robocop 2 here does complicate and muddle Robocop vs. the Terminator's story. You see, the game in the comic story revolves around the idea that Robocop was the key to Skynet developing sentience. Basically, Alex Murphy was a prototype for the rogue AI because he was the first and only surviving time that sentient consciousness was successfully merged with machine. And that's all well and fine in theory, but it's kind of weird to see that be the case in the game because, well, what about Robocop 2? In the movie, he was OCP's second successful attempt at combining man and metal after several botched trials, and was only a success due to the human they used being a cult-like drug dealer with a strong enough will to survive post-procedure and not rip his own face off. Basically, it's just kind of weird that Murphy's Robocop becomes the basis of Skynet in the game because it also establishes that Robocop 2 is alive and well, at least until you wipe the floor with him, and because that specific character already exemplifies the whole homicidal maniac angle that Skynet has going for it. Making things worse, the game doesn't even delve into detail as to why the character is even around to begin with, and while it's definitely cool to see Robocop 2's awesome character design realized with the great looking 16 bit sprite, it just raises a few too many questions about his presence that could have been done away had they just thrown another Terminator into the level or even one of those awful cyborg ninjas from Robocop 3 instead. I guess Murphy killing him at the end of the level does more or less close the book on the idea of him being the basis for Skynet though, so this could just be nitpicking on my part, but it does also lead into another issue I had with the game in general, which is the absolute scarcity of narrative. Even though the manual does actually lay things out for you in a page and a half long summary of the comic book, the game does give you a text primer on things upon boot up, and I suppose you could also just read the comic if you actually cared about the story to begin with, this was still a pretty big disappointment for me. DISAPPOINTED! I mean, we're talking about Robocop and Terminator after all, two classic sci-fi action properties that had pretty well told and emotionally resonant human stories at their core. It just would have been pretty cool to get at least a glimmer of that on display here, you know? I know. A big part of the appeal of crossover media to begin with is getting to watch characters you love react to seeing each other, and even the smallest attempt at that would have gone a long way in giving this game some character. Not that the game necessarily needs more excitement though, I guess, because as mentioned earlier, you're basically on your toes for the majority of it anyway. Thankfully though, Robocop's actually a fairly spry guy in the Genesis game. He can scamper up ladders surprisingly fast, he's weirdly adept at jumping for a guy that weighs several hundred pounds, and he can even dangle and skedaddle on railings and cables like he's Bill or Lance in Contra 3. I wouldn't say that he's grace in motion or anything, nor that he moves particularly quickly, but moving as him does feel good and snappy. Similarly, crouching to fire at enemies feels good, and you can also fire diagonally, though just not from a standstill. However, you can't steal people's refrigerators while the Back to the Future 3 theme plays like he does in an old, definitely unlicensed Korean fried chicken commercial though, so yeah, that sucks. <laughs> If I had to compare your movement to characters in any other video games, I'd say it's a bit like Simon Belmont's in Super Castlevania 4. You're basically just mobile enough to make dodging feel viable, and as if that weren't enough, you can also straight up destroy enemy shots with your flamethrower if you're lucky. I know how broken that sounds when said aloud, but it isn't actually quite as game breaking as you think it'd be despite the huge utility that it brings to you. And that's honestly the best way that I could describe the game and its balancing. It has a bunch of stuff that you'd think would either really work for or against you, but they're often counterweight against something that makes them a bit more bearable. For example, there's a ton of enemies out to get you and you'll soak up damage like a sponge in a bucket of water, but you do respawn wherever you died and you do have a few continues. Plus, enemies don't respawn after you've beaten them too. If they're dead, they actually stay dead. 
Likewise, the game allows you to clip through cover to shoot enemies while staying safe from their fire. Heck, there were even rare moments when Terminators used it to get the upper hand against you. I don't know if this is technically a bug, an exploit, or intended design, but I do know that it really helps make the more bullet hell sections a lot more tolerable. Another goodie on the game's part is that it runs at a solid frame rate. There were definitely a few dips towards the end of the game that I noticed, but aside from those things, the game was as smooth as butter. Honestly, in a lot of ways, Robocop vs. The Terminator feels tailor-made for the Genesis on a conceptual level. Even though there are definitely glaciers that can move faster than Robocop at a full sprint, the game has lightning-fast gameplay and action that just doesn't quit. And visually, the hardware's graphical capabilities are put to great use, creating layered and detailed detailed environments that feel straight out of its source material. There is a certain griminess to these graphics that scream Genesis, and it works really well. I'd buy that for a dollar. As for the music, it's also got some great sounds and tunes going for it. It was done by Mark Steven Miller, and funnily enough, while I was working on this video, I actually found a comment he left on another video about his work on the soundtrack that confirmed my suspicions that it was done using gems. For those that are unaware, Gems was a sound driver for the Genesis that devs like to use for its relative accessibility that's notorious for giving many Genesis games their iconic twangy and somewhat farty sound. And thankfully, Mr. Miller's work with the driver is top-notch and exemplifies everything wonderful that the tech is capable of when properly utilized. The soundtrack has some really great tunes going for it that combines everything from electronic to funk, and it gets you really pumped up. I guess my only complaint with it is that it doesn't really feel like the kind of music you'd expect from Robocop or the Terminator though, but even then, the music itself is so catchy and effective in what it does that it's hardly a big deal. I did find it kinda weird that the music drops out for some of the boss battles though. It just kinda made things feel empty and a bit subdued when you'd want them to have been bigger and more exciting. Overall, Robocop vs. The Terminator is a great game. Even though it was just a bit too hard for me personally, the game's got some great action going for it and is a visual feast on the eyes with its clean graphics and slick frame rate. However, because the game isn't perfect thanks to some very occasional slowdown and just how busy the screen can get at points, as well as how weird the weapon pickups felt for me and the lack of storytelling present in it, I'd say that the game just misses out on being an S-tier title. That said, it's close. You know, I was actually really impressed by this one. If all the other Robocop vs. The Terminator games come out anywhere near as good as this one, all the data I'll get from them will probably result in a nearly indestructible killing machine. One that's as seemingly indestructible and unstoppable as a Nokia phone, a pile of Legos that you walk on top of, or the constant stream of Office reruns on cable. I'll be back. And I am back. I'm back. For good. All right, everybody, my name is Niche, and for those of you just tuning into this video, yep, we're doing this in the style of a radio bumper for some reason, I'm about to cover the second version of Robocop vs. The Terminator. And I hope that everybody listening to this right now is having a good time driving wherever they're going to do whatever it is they plan to do. Yes, sir, I hope you aren't contemplating whether or not you're losing your humanity by having to do whatever it is you have to do while you're going wherever it is you have to go. Next up is the Master System and Game Gear versions of the game, which were developed by NMS Software and is the closest thing to a direct port of the Genesis title as any of these games ended up being. Even though the Master System version never left Europe, it's the main version that I'll be showcasing today in this video, as it's identical to the Game Gear one aside from having less screen crunch. It's also worth mentioning though that my footage of the Master System game is sped up a bit, as it is a PAL game being played back with NTSC settings. For what it's worth though, it actually feels better to play this way, and I did also play the Game Gear version at the correct speed. This version of the game is essentially a demake of the 16-bit Sega version and features the same basic gameplay and art style found in that original release. In fact, as far as I can tell, the stages are even directly lifted from the Genesis release and are presented with few, if any, alterations here. It also features a better difficulty curve, smaller and obviously more simplified sprites, and swaps out the original Gems soundtrack for a more traditional chiptune one that doesn't always fit the gameplay but is fairly catchy on its own merits. 
If the 16-bit Sega soundtrack was strong, but didn't match the tone of Robocop or the Terminator, this one's even more far removed from the source material, but feels more at home in a video game. There's also a few gameplay tweaks, such as not being able to switch your weapons at will, not having every weapon from the Genesis version at your disposal, and the fact that using ladders reverts your weapon to a pistol until you step off of it. There's also the addition of a health bar for bosses, and you also don't get the zoomies anymore whenever you start climbing a ladder like you did in the Genesis game. Oh, and there's also a super awkward feature in the form of Robocop having two different jumps. By holding up on the D-pad and jumping, you're able to do a higher jump than the one you'd do if you had just hit the button on its own. And while it may not sound that bad, it's actually a bit awkward and can make dodging enemy fire more complicated than it probably needed to be. Jump! For what it's worth though, the Genesis game did technically have this quirk in it too, though it was a lot less pronounced there. Honestly, this is a great version of the game in theory, and it's really impressive for being as fleshed out as it is despite the hardware it's on. The only problem with it though is that it's just a bit too much for Sega's 8-bit consoles to handle. For starters, it runs slower than the Genesis version and looks choppier in motion. It also features slowdown whenever the action picks up and enemies start to fill the screen, is also just a bit too glitchy for my liking, and also features flicker. I'm usually not the biggest nitpicker when it comes to Flickr, but in the case of this version of Robocop vs. the Terminator, it actually got to be a bit annoying. For example, at the end of one of the levels, you go up against a boss with bullets that can literally turn invisible because of it. And while you can just brute force your way through the battle, that's still pretty lame that your enemy's fire disappears like that. That, coupled with awkward jumping, just makes things feel a bit too unfair in a way that the other Sega game didn't. In the case of that game, things genuinely felt fair and were just heavily stacked against you, but in this version, it almost feels like the hardware is playing dirty in order to beat you. Not entirely unlike Skynet trying to 86 John Connor because he has cheat codes that allows him to defeat them. It just feels dirty, like trying to rob a charity, or trying to assassinate a future enemy before they even have the chance to become your enemy in the first place. Still, this version's got some great stuff going for it. Aside from the sheer impressiveness of this game feeling as faithful to the 16-bit Sega one as it does, I also appreciated the fact that the pistol felt more viable here. It also packed a decent punch in the Genesis game, but something about it here made it feel more balanced and like a weapon I could use for the entire game if I wanted to. On top of that, it actually still maintains voice samples in it that are similar to the ones found in the Genesis game and sound really good for the hardware. And I also really like the use of color in this one too for that matter. The opening city levels are rendered with these strong blues that remind me of the color scheme used for night sequences in Terminator 2 and it looks so striking in action. You know, in fact... That's definitely not setting anything up. Oh, and my personal favorite thing that this game has going for it is the fact that it may have the single smoothest walking animation that I've ever seen. I mean, it's way smoother than it has any right to be, and it's borderline distracting. I don't know, man, calves just weren't made to move this fluidly. Take them in, people. I shaved them for you. Anyway, weird fixation with RoboCav's Robot Cops aside, that's really all she wrote when it comes to the 8-bit Sega version of RoboCop vs. the Terminator. It's a really cool take on the 16-bit release that's extremely impressive and well-made for the hardware it's on, but also feels somewhat obsolete due to the fact that most people playing these games for the first time are gonna do it through emulation, and at that point, you could just play the Genesis version. And I don't mean that as a put-down against this game or anything. It's just that the best thing it had going for it was that the Game Gear release was on a portable, which I guess the Genesis game was too if you count the Sega Nomad, and that it was a good enough version of the game that it was representative of. In the context of a game released in the 90s, that's nothing to sneeze at and makes for a genuinely good version of the game. However, within the context of 2022 going on 2023, it just doesn't do enough to continue to stand out. Because while you could play this and even use something like overclocking your console on an emulator to get it to run a bit better, you may as well just play the Genesis version at that point since it feels like a more fully realized version of the game. 
Had this game not had as much flicker or slowdown as it has, I may be singing a different tune, but as far as giving it a letter grade goes, its technical issues, coupled with the fact that it owes just a bit too much to the 16-bit Genesis game to be worth checking out these days, pulls what would have been a solid B-tier game down to a high or even a mid C for me. Which, quick aside, I don't think is a bad grade. It just means that the game had some potential, but ended up feeling a bit too middle of the road to fully capitalize on it. Hello? Hey, is everything alright? Are you sure you're okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine, I guess. Who's calling? Something's wrong. She hasn't shot him yet. Dude, what are you even talking about? Belowski, is that you? Dude, you can't keep calling me. What if my mom's watching? Hello? Hello? That was weird. In keeping with 8-bit versions of the game that were available for handhelds, I thought I'd check out the Game Boy version next. For the record though, I thought I'd just get it out of the way from now that you aren't listening to the game's soundtrack in the background though since there wasn't a rip of it anywhere online to use. Instead, I'll be using music from Robocop or Terminator Game Boy games here. This release of Robocop vs. The Terminator was developed by Unexpected Development and is the shortest of the bunch with a play length that's just about half as long as the others and lasts about 30 minutes. Seeing as this one's on the Game Boy, it's also the most primitive version of the bunch and has the least animation, features, and plays at an infuriatingly slow speed. It also features obnoxiously oversized sprites that take up a huge chunk of the screen, and while they did this in order to keep things viewable seeing as it was designed for an unbacklit screen, leads to issues like screen crunch and some truly awful scrolling. I mean, take something like Metroid 2 or Operation C, which actually had decent scrolling for the hardware and came out before this game and compare it to this. It's night and day. And while we're on the visuals, it also has one of the awkwardest looking Robocop sprites that I've ever seen. Something about this version of the character just looks wrong, particularly in his arms, which are drawn way too long and like they're Dick Jones' arms at the end of the first Robocop. And sorry, because I don't want to fixate on this, but I can't get over how awful that Robocop sprite looks. It genuinely looks like something that could have been made on MS Paint in like five minutes, and I should know because I basically did just that a couple of years ago for my podcast. His name is Cyborg Boy, and he's a pastiche of Robocop that my friends Mike Raekwon and I created while reviewing the Robocop Terminator knockoff movie Cyborg Cop back in 2020. Cyborg Boy, did you no. Wikipedia the answers to your... History exam, <laughs> Cyborg Boy. <laughs> that was Cyborg Boy talk. Uh, no. The Windows XP error sound is how <laughs> Cyborg Boy <laughs> talks. Much to the game's credit though, this is a completely unique version of the game. I honestly expected it to be a port of the unlicensed NES one, which I'll be reviewing last since it never even got released, but no, it's actually an original game. It also doesn't seem to take that much from other existing 8-bit Robocop games either, which is commendable enough in its own right, though also unfortunate since those are comparatively better games. I mean, at least those games knew not to give us a gangly looking Robocop in them. Originality aside though, this is a really bare bones game. Much like the 8-bit Sega versions, you can't switch weapons in this one, and there are also less power-ups to go around in general. And making things worse, you lose any upgraded weapon you have after taking a single hit. Thankfully though, it's not that hard to avoid getting hit, as this is actually a pretty easy game. Robocop may not be the bullet sponge you'd expect him to be, but it also doesn't stop you from being able to get through most of these challenges unscathed by enemies. I do specify by enemies here though, because you are gonna get scratched up here and there thanks to the game's weird thing for platforming. Even though each of the versions of Robocop vs. the Terminator do feature platforming in some way, shape, or form, it's pushed very heavily as well as more traditionally in the Game Boy version, which for the record was probably the single worst place to emphasize it in to begin with on account of its low frame rate and how cramped your field of view is. By the end of the game, you'll have to do some platforming challenges that would be an absolute cakewalk on any other console, but ends up being fairly frustrating due to how you can barely see where you're going. I wouldn't call it hard, it's more annoying than anything, but it shows that the game's design has a knack for smacking its head against the wall as opposed to accounting for what were, by then, the hardware's well-known limitations. 
And the game's enemy types have the same problem too. Instead of putting you up against larger and easier to see enemies, a huge chunk of the game has you going up against smaller foes that you can barely manage to aim at. And even though you can aim diagonally, it's only facing up and while you're moving, which makes it a lot less practical than it needed to be. Plus, the game doesn't throw anywhere near enough actual Terminators at you to begin with, and even though I actually don't mind the use of spiders or drones for enemies, for example, Terminator Resistance loved to throw Skynet controlled spiders and drones your way all the time and it was pretty awesome there, the fact that you don't go around killing T-800s for most of a game called Robocop vs. The Terminator is really disappointing. I guess I'm just like offended, maybe? Like, okay, what, I'm not good enough to get to fight a couple of Terminators? Like, okay, you could send like a dozen Terminators through time to kill everyone from John Connor to Sarah Connor to that person in Terminator Dark Fate to Axl Rose and Guns N' Roses in a music video, but not me? Not me. I don't have the right to be hunted by Terminators on a Game Boy. No, no, no. That's just, that's where you draw the line, Skynet. Really? That's a little offensive. That's a little mean. What, am I not worth the thrill of being hunted by a couple of Terminators every so often? You know, on second thought, it's fine, actually. Just... as you were. It really makes you wonder why this version of the game is the way that it is, as all a Robocop-themed side-scrolling shooter really had to do was take the template set in place by other entries in the genre and throw a licensed character onto it while accounting for the hardware that the game would be running on. Alternatively, and like I mentioned earlier, there was also already a Robocop-themed game on the Game Boy that could have been used as a basic guide for which to base this one's gameplay on. I really don't have much else to say about this one. I wouldn't call it the worst thing I've ever played by a long shot, but I also can't think of any reason to seek this out other than out of morbid curiosity. If you want some really weird trivia about this game, though, its theme was used in an old Ariston commercial back in the 90s and was apparently even licensed, cleared, and everything. And Ultimately, this game gets a D, representing the fact that it just barely ekes out a passing grade. This is tactically dangerous. Drive faster. Killing Niche might actually prevent the war. I don't care! Haven't you learned anything yet? Haven't you figured out why you can't kill people? Developed by Interplay, the SNES version of Robocop vs. the Terminator is the other main version of the Robocop vs. the Terminator games and was released a bit before the Genesis version, even though it entered development after that specific skew. Much like the Game Boy game and the NES version that I'll be getting to next, it's also an entirely original title that, while similar in some of its mechanics and ideas to the Genesis one, also goes out and does its own thing, which was fairly common at the time amongst multi-platform releases. Right off the bat, this game immediately immediately establishes itself above the Genesis version as far as its storytelling goes by actually including cutscenes that tell the story of the comic in a truncated and simplified fashion. It's nothing special, mind you, but it does remedy my biggest gripe with the other 16-bit version, which was that it basically just pulled the Kyle Reese and yelled at you to SHUT UP before throwing you at a gauntlet of Terminators to fend for yourself. Tangentially, something about that kind of reminded me of how Smosh videos used to open. Yeah, remember Smosh? That channel that was like the number one sub channel on YouTube for a while before- SHUT UP! Okay. I actually really appreciated this because it allows you to have the actual context that you may have found yourself wishing you'd had on the other versions, and again, while it's hardly spectacular, it at least gets the job done. The game also has a ton of other small fixes that I appreciated too, such as pickups working more traditionally, being able to aim while you're standing still, and a password system. There is even a pretty nifty first-person stage where Robocop storms Skynet from the inside of a tank. Capping this version's positives off, it also has some fairly good-looking sprites that adequately represent what they're supposed to, and a soundtrack that, while in my opinion isn't as good as the Genesis one and isn't all that memorable, does kind of resemble some of Brad Fidel's music from the original Terminator. Oh, and the song for the first level even kinda sounds like the 80s French Cold Wave and electropunk duo Cast Products song, Never Come Back. On paper, a lot of these things probably sound like they'd make the SNES version of Robocop vs. the Terminator the go-to release, right? Well, not quite. 
The game falls just a bit too short of even reaching the quality of the Genesis game, let alone surpassing it, and that's mainly due to how it keeps taking one step forward and two steps back with regards to some of its design. For starters, one of the best things about the Genesis game was that killing an enemy meant that they were gone for good, even if you walked away and backtracked to that spot later. And that's one of the first things you'll probably notice isn't the case here as enemies respawn after you leave the screen. Making things worse, you're basically the only thing that doesn't respawn in this version as dying no longer leads to you reappearing where you last were and instead forces you to replay sections that you've already gone through. Additionally, dying means getting stuck with your pistol again until you can find an upgrade and that feels especially punishing in some cases due to how your bullets can seemingly bounce off a huge number of the enemies that you'll go up against. Don't do that. Some of these encounters can feel outright painful and mocking because every time you knock a Terminator down, they'll just get back up and go, I'm back. And it doesn't stop there either. The game features gameplay that's slower and chunkier than the Genesis one. Though in its defense, it does actually feel fairly good in action, especially since it does help you feel more like you're the actual Robocop in a way. Unfortunately though, the game does have some slowdown, though it's not as bad as it was in some of the other versions that I discussed in this video. However, it's definitely there and it's a shame that it is though. All in all, this is a fairly good version of the game. While it never reaches the same highs as the Genesis one, it's still a pretty good time and maybe worth checking out if you're looking for a slower, slightly easier take on the idea of a Robocop Terminator crossover. I personally want to give it an A for the effort alone and because of its cool first person level, but in execution, the game probably falls somewhere in the mid to low Bs. It's definitely worth a glance though if you think you can overlook some of its flaws, want to overclock an emulator, or just really loved any of the other versions and wanted more Robocop vs. the Terminator. So yeah, the SNES game was fairly decent, and um, with that out of the way, I think we could finally get into talking about the last game on the list, which is the NES version of Robocop vs. the Terminator. Developed by Real Time Associates, the NES version of Robocop vs. the Terminator was never completed as far as I can tell, nor was it released to the public. In fact, the only reason we can play it to begin with is because someone found, dumped, and preserved the game online. Just don't tell Nintendo, because they don't like when we emulate stuff. The game is yet another unique release, and despite its unreleased state, is a fully playable title with cutscenes, complete levels that maybe needed to be touched up a little bit before release because yikes, they can be a bit patchy, and music. And yeah, you heard me right, this version has cutscenes like the SNES version did. While there are only three of them, they're well illustrated for the NES and remind me of cutscenes from Ninja Gaiden a bit, even though they're lacking in animation and backgrounds. In a couple ways, this game feels like a cross between the SNES and Game Boy games. It's got cutscenes like the Super Nintendo game, as well as the weighty movement found there too, while also maintaining the weird emphasis on more traditional platforming that the Game Boy game had. It's a weird combo that works a bit better than I expected it to, mostly due to the game being zoomed out enough to actually see what you're doing and where you're going, though it's not without its faults. For instance, there's the jumping. Robocop's slow and bulky movement, coupled with the zoomed out camera, constantly made me feel like I was never able to make the jumps that were required of me. And on top of that, you can only just barely make these jumps to begin with. It's hilarious to think that the simplest platforming challenges are enough to bring a complete and utter badass like Robocop to his knees, but well, here we are. He may as well be Ed 209 trying to go down a flight of stairs. By the end of the game, you'll be asked to make some jumps that can get a bit frustrating and aren't helped by the fact that Robocop actually suffers from fall damage here, though it is also fine for the most part. Playing this version of the game was a bit weird for me because in spite of, or perhaps because of the NES's hardware limitations, it was actually the version of the game that made me feel most like I was playing as Robocop. However, whether or not that's good enough to justify this game's extremely slow pace is up to you. The action is also fairly decent here too. Granted, the game does suffer from quite a bit of slowdown whenever there's a bit too much going on and that does get frustrating, but it also kinda worked in favor of things too. 
I may sound like a raving lunatic for saying it, but Robocop vs. the Terminator NES feels like one of those rare instances when slowdown actually helps things and how impactful they feel. I don't remember who said this, it may have been the AVGN in one of his older videos, or maybe just something I read or thought to myself over the years, but slowdown in NES games can sometimes feel like watching the seams come undone on a title from how utterly epic the action on screen is. The slowdown almost makes your bullets feel stronger, like the collision of your attack against the enemy is so destructive that it made the game stutter, like a heart skipping a beat or the way that a controller rumbles whenever you get hit in more modern video games. It's a weirdly intuitive feeling that works when you rationally know it shouldn't, and tangentially, I kinda think it'd be cool to see retro-inspired games artfully try to incorporate that into their design someday. Some of these levels could've used a bit more time in the oven, though. Even though the level designs are fine enough for the most part, they just never felt like they were particularly inspired or representative enough of the locations that they were supposed to be. And while a lot of that probably has something to do with the fact that this is an NES game, it's also a shame since the Game Gear and Game Boy versions didn't run into that problem. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this chapter, their layouts also leave a bit to be desired, too. There were a decent number of moments where it felt seemingly impossible not to get hit by an enemy, and even though you can actually avoid that in some of these situations, it still felt a bit frustrating. Speaking of the level designs though, I did really like that the second stage featured an unkillable Terminator that basically needed to be shot and pushed into acid. It felt really Tim Burton's Batman, and I really enjoyed that. Speaking of Batman 89, the game's color choices are also really reminiscent of Sunsoft's Batman NES game too, and I absolutely loved it. I think I mentioned this in my Samari review, but I've always loved the way the developers had to creatively reuse colors to get around the NES's color palette limitations and how it often led to games having this surrealist quality to them. I don't know, I thought it had a cool and distinctly retro look about itself. In a lot of ways, it's honestly a shame this version never got released. While it wouldn't have set the world ablaze or anything, it's actually a pretty competent version of Robocop vs. the Terminator. As for why it never hit shelves, one can only assume that it was because it was determined that it wouldn't sell enough to be worth it. Who knows, maybe it was cancelled for a tax write-off or something. It wouldn't be the first time that something like that's happened, and I did mention that Orion Pictures was in dire financial straits at the time, and maybe that had something to do with it. Heck, at the time of me doing the pre-writing for this video, the same exact thing is happening with a fully filmed Batgirl movie over at Warner Brothers. And if that's the case, it's just a shame they didn't cancel the Game Boy game over this one since it was the much better title. It feels and plays like a slower version of Batman NES with elements of Contra and maybe Castlevania thrown into the mix. Also, not to go off on a tangent, though that's something I think I'm actually kind of known for at this point, did you know that Sunsoft had a Game Boy version of Batman? It's like a side-scrolling shooter, and that's so weird, dude. I seriously gotta do a Batman video one of these days. Anyway, moving on. Overall, I'd give Robocop vs. the Terminator for NES a mid-C. It's not quite as polished as the Master System or Game Gear game, and may actually feature a bit more flickering than that version, but it's still a good time and is probably the more interesting release between them due to being its own thing. At the same time though, it definitely pushes the NES to its limits and is just barely able to execute on its ambitions. And there you have it! That's every version of Robocop vs Terminator reviewed! I can confidently say that I didn't expect myself to have to play through this many versions of the same game when I set out to review them, but that I'm also ultimately glad that I got to. At the very least, it means that I have more than enough data to use to create a new full-body prosthesis for Copernicus, one that'll be nearly indestructible. And with it, we'll just… hang out. Maybe play some video games. Watch some movies. He'll probably enjoy Cyborg Cop, right? You think I can cut that, Copernicus? Yeah, I think I could cut that. Feels a little superfluous. Okay, um, whatever. So... <laughs> Mom? Is that you? Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up! It's all your fault! I'm not gonna let you do it. So I guess he's out for Cyborg Cop, then. You're not gonna stab me, are you? This is the 
vehicle stop speed. What the hell? All of this over niche? I need a vacation. So, does Robocop vs. the Terminator hold up? No. Not really. I mean, like some of them do. Each of the versions of this game have glaring emissions from them that are fairly hard to overlook when taken as a whole. All of the non-Genesis games either feature noticeable amounts of slowdown, flicker, both, music that doesn't always fit the concept of a Robocop Terminator crossover, and while several of the versions were definitely fun, I just don't know if it's anything worth getting too excited about unless you're already a fan of the genre or love these properties and want to experience something different pertaining to them. However, that's all excluding the Genesis game because even though that one doesn't tell you the crossover story, it's still an excellent action game with great visuals, high octane action that isn't bogged down with many frame rate issues, and a genuinely catchy soundtrack. Still, I guess you could check out the other versions of the game if you really want to. None of them are really that bad aside from maybe the Game Boy version, but rather just pale in comparison to the Genesis game. Heck, the Super Nintendo game is actually pretty good in its own right too, and might make for a fun double feature when paired with the Genesis one. <laughs> Look at me, talking about video game pairings like I'm a wine connoisseur or something. That's what we call trying to work past whatever just happened here. If you do happen to check a few of these different games out, I definitely recommend following my tier list from top to bottom though, as it'll prevent some of the game quality whiplash I felt jumping through these versions out of order. Again though, if I had to pick one version to stick with, it'd definitely be the Genesis one, as even if it didn't have the Robocop and Terminator IPs attached to it, it'd still be a pretty top-notch game. Overall, I thought the idea of a Robocop vs. Terminator game was a good one. In fact, I'd genuinely love to see some developers take another crack at it with modern gameplay conventions someday. Maybe Taeon, the devs of Terminator Resistance, and the upcoming Robocop Rogue City will get to it eventually. And if they do, that it'll come out pretty good. Anyway, that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and that if you did, you feel free to share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel, or do any of that kind of social engagement-y stuff that helps my channel grow. Additionally, you're more than welcome to support me by subscribing to my Patreon or donating to my Buy Me A Coffee. Subscribers to either one of those get access to bonus goodies like commentary tracks for videos, video answers to the question of the day, which you should totally answer if you haven't already, by the way, and um, basically like just short clips from future videos, stuff like that. You know, it's pretty laid back, it's chill. If you enjoy the channel and you have the disposable income and want to throw it at me, throw away, hit me right between the eyes. Not actually. If you see me on the street, don't start pelting me with money. I'll appreciate it, but I'll be in pain. Anyway, tangent aside, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram by looking up at Niche Plays on those respective platforms. And if you aren't sick of my voice yet, you could also check out my movie and TV podcast, Media Obscura, on your favorite podcast player. It's hosted by myself, along with my girlfriend Sierra and my best friend Raekwon, and we talk about old and obscure movies and TV shows about once a month on it. For October, we're going to be talking about Terminator The Sarah Connor Chronicles, which was a short-lived show from the mid-2000s about Terminator. It's basically a sequel to T2 that pretends that all the other movies hadn't happened and kind of does its own thing. It's actually a pretty good show. It's kind of like 24 meets Terminator in a few ways. So yeah. Bye.